Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptising in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to meet him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And welcome back, Pauline. She's been in Singapore. It's great to have you back. Okay, we ready for the Word of God? Yeah. Thanks, Pete. It's great to see you, brother. Thanks for the word you spoke into the church last Sunday. Really appreciate it. It's always good when you come back. So last Sunday I was out at New Hope uh, Church. It's a Baptist church plant, as we call it. It's a new church out at Kellyville. Uh, speaking out there, a couple of years ago, we financially sowed into that church. And uh, I was invited to come out there and bring some of the word. And when you come back and you, you hear of uh, what's been spoken into church in the morning when I wasn't here, and when people can repeat it, that's a very good sign that the Spirit of God's been, been working. It's just not just drifted off into the ether. It's actually there and real. But I want to speak to you uh, from the book of Mark uh, over the next few weeks and obviously leading into Christmas. We're going to focus on Jesus. Would that be okay? That's a, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, that, that's not something I expect you to say no to. Like, one day I'm going to look up the word, of word meaning for rhetorical and actually find out whether I've used that correctly or not. I don't know. But... Um, we're going to speak about Jesus. And so, obviously, leading up to Christmas, this is the great revelation of the Father through Christ as a baby. That's true. Uh, but something so massive happened at that moment. It's changed the world forever. On Friday night, I was sitting with uh, my family and we were watching Terminator Genesis. Probably didn't expect that to come out of my mouth this morning, did you? I, I, I like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's just the 80s just really did it for me. What's funny about that? Anyway, there's one line in it which he talks about a nexus point. When a nexus point happens, uh, it is so significant it changes lives. And when Christ was born, it was such a significant moment in time that it changes eternity. And so if you want to see nexus points that happen in our world, that's one. There are lots of nexus points that happen inside of your own life, is there not? Okay, the, the day you have a, a baby for the very first time, that changes things. A little bit. Ever. Remember that day when you thought, this is not going to change us, the baby's going to fit really well in my schedule and we're still going to go out. And... You remember that day? <laughs> nexus points. Uh, so the day that you came to Christ, right, when he spoke something into your world that actually impacted you at a level to go, wow, there's something more going on on this planet, is a nexus point. I'll have to look that up in the dictionary too to see whether I'm using that right. It's not in the Bible. I'm just quoting from Terminator, right, right now. We'll get to the Word of God in a, in a little while, but uh, a nexus point. When Mark writes his Gospel... There is a time in Mark's life where he has gone, you know what, I need to do something with all the stories. I've actually got to write them down. And something in Mark, so we have four Gospels that, are, that have been recorded. They say there are more, but these are the four that are closest to Jesus' time that we know. And Mark is the oldest one. They think Mark was actually written first. And there's something about Mark when he decides to put a, 
something to papyrus, like an ink to papyrus, that he goes, you know what, this is so important, something so significant has happened inside of my world and the world that we can actually see that I'm actually going to record it and it becomes part of the purpose of his life. The only way that they connect Mark to this gospel, because he's not, it doesn't say, hey, I'm Mark, just writing a story, just like to know what I saw. It doesn't say that at all. There's only one little glimpse of Mark that we think is found in this gospel, and you'd be surprised to know where it is. It's, it's when Jesus is being betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and uh, the soldiers come in, and there's a, there's a bit of a ruckus, and Peter cuts a guy's ear off. Jesus sticks it back on incredibly or miraculously. Uh, and then there's one young guy that runs away naked. Guess who Mark is in that story? That's a nexus point. You get beat up so bad you've got no clothes on. There's something's changed right there. Isn't that right? And I don't know if it was that moment, but there are moments inside of your life which God speaks something into your world that things start changing and you start recognising God is actually bigger than what you think he is. He's in more control than what you think he actually is. And you just see that there is a relationship to be had in the Father. Mark discovered that. Now I want you to look at verse chapter 1 and we're just going to pick apart verse 1 to start with. Here is Mark. This is the way he starts. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Is there any doubt in that statement? It's not like Luke, where Luke says, well, listen, I've put together a series of stories that's in evidence, uh, and I'd just like you to read this, Theophilus, and just see how, how this goes with you. Mark just goes this. This is the good news. Jesus, who is actually the Messiah, that's not his last name, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and there's a full stop, period. That's the opening statement for this man's story. Jesus, who is the good news the Messiah, the Son of God, and let's just not question that. That's Mark's statement. Who's up for that? Isn't that cool? Now, how does Mark get to that point where he just goes, this is the good news, right? The good news that I have been set free. The good news that I have been forgiven. The good news that I am transforming. The good news that I've got life eternal. How do you get to the point where that's just the good news? How do you get to the point where you just go, Jesus, well... The Messiah, they, those two things work very well together. I'm not separating those. Jesus, the Messiah, who is the Son of God. Something has had to happen in his world for him to open up his gospel to say, here's what it's all about. What do they call that bit at the first part of an essay? You know when you write an essay, what's that bit where you... There's, there's another word for introduction. Come on, Trish, what is it? A synopsis. There it is. A synopsis, and here's, here's Mark going, here's what it's all about. It's good news, it's not bad, it's great news, it's good, and that's what the word gospel means in the Greek there, it just means good news. Uh, and it says, Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the Son of God. Full stop. Very controversial in the first century. But to Mark, no brainer. Not negotiable. Don't try and even talk him out of it. I've seen what I've seen. I know what I know. This is what it's all about. What has, happened, what has had to happen in your life for you to stick your hands straight up and go, this is the good news, that Christ is the Messiah, the one who we've been waiting for, the one who is going to open up heaven for us, the one who is going to deliver us, and he is the Son of God. What has had to happen in your world that this is the case? It's not like you just wake up one morning and go, you know what, today is the day. Something has occurred in your world where you have been drawn or where you have grown or where you've been shocked or where you've been spoken to or a revelation has happened to bring you to a space that you can say this is the good news that Christ is the Messiah and he is the Son of God. If you want to call that something, if you want to put it into a word, here's the word we use, faith. Just faith. And that is what pleases God. No ifs, no buts. That's what pleases God. 
That's why Judas' greatest sin wasn't that he betrayed Christ, it's just that he didn't believe in Christ. Because every sin can be forgiven except when you reject Christ. Right? You are for that. The good news that Jesus is the Messiah, there's only one, the Son of God, and he backs it up with this. You might have heard of this guy, his name is Isaiah. Uh, this is what Mark is saying. Isaiah is one of those legends of the faith. Uh, it's like one of the big prophets, the major prophets, as we call him. It wasn't one of those little minor prophets that you don't even know. How do you spell Obadiah anyway? Like, it's not like that. This is one of the big prophets, and his name is Isaiah, and this is what he said. So here's Mark saying, it's not just my testimony. It's actually coming from 600 years ago. It's from the prophet Isaiah, and he said there's going to be a person who's coming who's out in the wilderness, and he's going to be shouting something. He's going to be a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. And this messenger was John the Baptist. Again, not his second name. You know, Jesus the Messiah, John the Baptist. They are known by who they are. How are you known? Can I ask that question? How are you known? Are you the tall one? Are you the short one? You tall? Are you the Italian? Is an Italian over here? Doesn't like olives. Doesn't doesn't drink wine. I'll drink wine. And what what else is it? There's something else. Chili. Doesn't like chili. Can you really call yourself the Italian? I'm not sure. Like that. I'm just I'm just not sure. He's pasta, and he hangs out with a pretty cool pasta too, don't you, mate? How are you known? Well, can we, can we just put a couple of people on the spot this morning? How is Zach known? He's the drummer. How else is he known? A brother? A son? Matt's son? How is he known? Come on. Speak it out loud. He's dependable. Is that what you said? He's faithful. He's a Christian. It makes me cry. Amen. He's known, right? He is known. How's Debbie known? How's Debbie known? She's loving. She's caring. She's a Christian. What did you say, Trish? She's creative. She's crazy. We're all a little crazy, Debbie, that's all right, you know. <laughs> she has a smile that makes you want to smile, right? That's infectious. That's how she's known. How's Ida known? She's, a, she's awesome organizer. What else? How is she known? Loving? Dependable? She's what? She's really, really good. Working for the Lord. She's really, really good too. She's a friend. You're able to receive that, Ida. That's how she is known. She doesn't stand up and say, hey, I'm a friend. That's how she's known. So John the Baptist, I, don't, I doubt whether he gave himself that name. That might be a little bit um, arrogant maybe, I don't know. If you just started calling yourself the Baptist. How do you become known as the Baptist? And just, just in case you're wondering, Baptists haven't been around that long. We're about four or 500 years old, right? That's the whole movement. And so to be known as the Baptist, how do you become known? You baptize. And what's John's baptism about? Repentance from our sins and turning to God. That's how he becomes known. Now, does that happen in a moment? How do you gain a reputation? Does it happen in a moment? Does it happen because you stand up and say, hey, I'm a friend? Come and friend me. How do you become known? How does he become known as the Baptist? It's not just one day he's decided, you know what, I'm just going to go out to the Jordan River and I'm just going to wait. 
I'm going to wait for people to find out I'm here. I'm going to wait to find that people are calling me the Baptist and they're going to come out and they're going to be baptised. That doesn't happen that way. John the Baptist by this stage is into his 30s and I'm assuming that some part of his life has already become known. So the guy is wearing what? Camel hair. Anyone wear camel hair? Is it one of those things that they use? Like, you know, like alpaca or llama or I don't know. What's cashmere? Like, what is that? Wendy's got something made of camel hair. Is it soft or what is it? It's soft. There you go. We've learned something new today. But he's wearing a leather belt. It's pretty much the only way that you can connect him and I right now is wearing a leather belt. I just haven't worn camel hair before, but he, he eats locusts and wild honey. Now, for people to do that in the first century, it means that they've made a vow, or it's like a rite. It's like with uh, Samson. When Samson was born, he wasn't allowed to cut his hair and grapes weren't allowed to go past his lips. Okay, It was a Nazarite vow. It was, it was one of those rites. And so John the Baptist was doing something like that. So he's wearing camel skin, which is a statement of poverty, a leather belt, and he's not eating, or well, he's only eating locusts and wild honey. Now, in the first century, if you're giving up things, you'd be giving up meat and you'd be giving up wine. Okay, now, for some reason, when you gave up meat, you were still allowed to eat fish and locusts. I know which one I would choose. I've never eaten a locust, not intentionally. I've eaten a few flies as I've been jogging, but that's never pleasurable. But John the Baptist is eating uh, locusts and, and, wild, and he's, he's drinking wild honey and that's just a, it's like a mead sort of thing. It's, it replaces um, wine or an alcoholic beverage and it's apparently quite good for you. So there you go. So wild honey is where it's at, right? Okay, so here's John the Baptist and he is known by what he wears. He is known by what he eats and he becomes known by what he does and it becomes who he is, right? Makes sense? And that takes time. It's got to start somewhere. So somewhere at some point in John the Baptist's time, he's been feeling convicted that I'm going to live my life to a vow and I'm not encouraging anyone to give up meat or, or wine or, or just wear camel hair or anything like that. If God's led you that way, all praise be to you, but um, it might just be you. Uh, so it, here is John the Baptist and he's becoming known because he's committed himself to something and he's following it and people have started understanding, people have started hearing and all of a sudden it's not this weird guy that just lives out there by the Jordan, it's this dude that yeah sure he dresses strange and sure he eats strange stuff but there's something happening which is drawing people to him and that drawing is the nexus point of their lives because it becomes a point in time when they get baptised that they are turning from their sin and turning to God. And what that means in Scripture is they're turning away from faithlessness to turn to faithfulness. They've turned away from doubt and unbelief and they're coming now to faith in God. Does that make sense? This is the nexus point. But it takes a journey. It takes a journey. And so part of this morning, I said, I really want to talk to you just about purpose in life and understanding what it is. So Jesus becomes known as the Messiah and that's 30 odd years in the making. He's always the Messiah, right? And John was always going to be the Baptist. But it takes time for people to come on board. It takes time for people to see. It takes time for people like Mark to go, you know what? This is the good news. Christ, Jesus is the Messiah and this is the Son of God. Period. And when he gets to that point, then he's got something to shout about. So the, the Bible says this, that John is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. Clear the road for him. Okay? And so obviously he's talking about Jesus. Now John goes on to say this, someone who's coming is greater than I am. And so everyone was going, wow, this is really awesome. Like even Pharisees were coming out to John to say, are you the Messiah? That's how good it was. Pharisees were asking the question. So don't think it's just this little thing that's happening on the side. So Mark says here that people were coming from all over Judea. In fact, all of Jerusalem has been emptied to come out here into the wilderness to hear some strange guy wearing some strange thing, eating strange kinds of food, but he's preaching a message that I cannot resist. Does that make sense? You're not going out there for the menu, are you? You're going out there for the word. 
You're going out there for the message and he's shouting something in the wilderness of preparing the way for the Lord and clear the road for the Lord's coming. And he says this, uh, someone who's coming is so far greater than I am that I'm not even worthy to untie the guy's sandals. Can I give you a history lesson right now? You ready for a history lesson? And so the person who unties the sandal of a Jew is a Canaanite slave. Okay, so if you don't know your history, the Jews displaced the Canaanites with the promised land. How do you reckon the Canaanites felt about Jews? And not like family, right? And, and so here's the level of social structure in the first century to the Jew was to say, and John the Baptist says, I want to put it in context for you. I just want to show you how big this thing is. I want to show you this nexus point that's about to happen. I want to show you just the one that follows me. And you think that this is good. You think that all of Jerusalem is turning from their sin is good. Well, the one who is coming is so far greater than I am that I'm not even worthy to be known as a Canaanite slave. Can you see the context now? Can you understand the context of what John is saying? He gets this understanding of Christ compared to him. And sometimes I wonder, we just need to step into the place of awe and just experience what it is to know the magnitude of who Christ is, of what Christ has done, so that we can enter into relationship with him. Now, the Bible says we can do that boldly, and that's cool. The Bible says that we do that in love, and that's cool. But we just don't forget the magnitude of who Christ is and what he has done and what he has given up. John the Baptist says, I'm not even, I am not even worthy to be a Canaanite slave. I, I don't even come close. You think this is big, but it's, it's, just, the, it's just like the, the foretaste. It's just like uh, the entree. It's just, it, this is what it is, and this is what's happening. And, and here's John, and he's using his voice uh, to shout. And when I say his voice, I don't mean that he's yelling it. I mean that he's being it. So Mark is using his voice by being in the letter. This is the life of Jesus through the eyes of Mark. This is his testimony. This is his witness. This is what he has seen Christ do. And here is Mark. He, he is preparing the way for Christ and he's clearing the road. John the Baptist is doing the same thing by what? By just being who God created him to be. Isn't that brilliant? So, so what are you shouting and what road are you clearing? So, and so just again, context, I don't mean go down the street corner and shout it. When you shout something, people can't not hear what you are. And so when I ask the question of who Zach is, he doesn't even have to utter a word and you guys know. When I ask the question who Ida is, she doesn't have to utter a word, and you guys know. When I ask the question who Debbie is, she doesn't have to utter a word. We already know. And so what people already know about you is something to do with what you're on this planet to do. And so what are you shouting and what road are you clearing for the coming of the Lord? Let's just make this practical in the eyes of the scripture. So John the Baptist by this stage is by the Jordan River and people are beating a road to him. Can you imagine a million people coming out to be baptised? I don't know how many people were there, but they said all of Jerusalem was empty. Now I don't think that every single human being came out of Jerusalem, but I'm guessing that Mark's going, you know what, this place is looking like a ghost town. Where are they? Or they're on their way to the Jordan River. To do what? Turn from sin and turn to God, right? So John, in being who he is, and being no one else, just being who he is and understanding what he's on this planet to do, people are beating a road to him. And here's the part for us today, church. If we can be who we are and understand why we're on this planet, people will find Christ because of you. That's the road you're clearing. And so often I have uh, hear of believers who, who effectively just want to live their lives on the edge of somebody else's road and go, wow, they're doing awesome. 
they're, they're doing great things for God and sure not everything's going right in their life but you know what you can see God working through it and, and, and so at times we live our lives through another person's road by going wow they're really happy right now I'm just going to step into that space as well well you know what don't shortchange yourself because Jesus has called you he hasn't just called Craig. He hasn't just called Lily. He hasn't called, just called Michael. He's called you and he's called you by name and he's got this purpose for you and there's something on the end of your name which says Claude the... And it's not the Italian, right, brother? Find that and, and do that and you're going to find that people are going to beat a path to Christ to get to you because they're going to see Christ in you and all of a sudden when they see Christ, they see something that's bigger than you and they know that this path and this journey has more on it than just a river at the end or just a dip in the lake or just a good friend or anything like that because they know God is doing something and when God's doing something, you can't take credit for that because it's beyond, it's bigger, it's just different and because before you know it, nexus points are happening in people's lives. Things of such significance start changing that before you know it, their lives are going 180 degrees from the direction they were before. What is your life shouting and what are you clearing from your road? Last Sunday morning when I was out at New Hope Church, I, I asked them the question, what does it mean to love Jesus? It's a simple question. But you know what? Sermons don't ever go for three minutes, do they? You've got to make more up than just that, right? Right? We're, amen? We're good with that? You're happy for 30 minutes, aren't you? Rochelle is, and therefore we can go forward, right? Haven't seen anyone looking at the clock yet. We can keep going. So I asked the question, what's it mean to love Jesus? And, and as you guys know, I always like to use that word love and explain it. And it means to be devoted to that person's best interests. So if you love Jesus, you are devoted to his best interests. And I said to them, what would it look like for New Hope Church to be devoted to Christ's best interests? I said, do we have anybody here like that? And all of a sudden, all his hands shut up. And it's just like, awesome. This is great. Anyway, after the service, one of the leaders comes to me and she says to me, that question you asked, that's a big question. To be devoted to Christ's best interests, to be all about him and not about me, that, that's a big, big statement. And she goes, I don't think, I don't know if I'm like that. And she says, I looked around and I saw all these people with their hands up and thought, are these people like that? And I said to her, what would it mean to you if they were? Stops her in her tracks and she just goes, um, it would be amazing. It would be amazing. And I said, pray that word into being. Let it be amazing. Let it be amazing. We sing it. We declare it. Uh, we've got to find new adjectives at times because at times we get in the, ourselves in the rut of saying the same thing over and over and over again. But just think for a moment, what would it look like for you to be utterly up for Jesus, like to be utterly devoted to his best interests? Like in your workplace, in your home, in your marriage, uh, as a mother, as a father, as a brother, as a sister, as a friend, as a relative, as a neighbour, what would it look like if you were utterly devoted to Christ's best interests, right? You're clearing a road. And so Jesus would say this, if you are up for that, this is what it looks like. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and you love one another as you love yourself. Do you get the common denominator? It's love, right? It's just love to be devoted. What would it look like for Haberfield Baptist Church to be utterly devoted to Christ's best interests on this planet? So the first question we've got to ask is what are his best interests? Do you know what they are? It's people. It's people. For God so loved the world, it doesn't mean the globe, it means people. That's what it means in the Greek when he says world, it's, it's the people that he gave. 
So what he gave, it's a gift. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Christ did not come to condemn this world. He came to save this world, right? And if you're like Mark and you've said this is the good news, that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the Son of God, uh, guess what? You've already had your nexus point. You're saved. Now, it's time for us to prepare the way, use our voice, use who we are, and clear the road. Don't stop asking God that question. So if you're sitting here this morning going, I have no idea what my purpose in life is, ask the question. And don't stop asking, because God's good like this. He says this, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. If you seek for me, you will find me, right? That's the scripture right there. We ready to pray? Uh, so I wonder whether you'd like to stand up and pray with me. I might get Laura to, to come on down and, and, and to play. Um, I'm thinking we might do Revelation song, uh, but I want you to stand up, uh, maybe as a statement of your nexus point. And maybe um, you're thinking, I'm still waiting for that. To stand up, that's faith. To stand up, I just want to encourage you into a space of just being like Mark, where doubt is removed from the table. This is the good news. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As foretold in the scriptures through the prophet Isaiah, there is a voice shouting in the wilderness to prepare the way. And this is what he shouts, prepare the way of the Lord. Clear the road for his coming. And that messenger was John the Baptist. And as believers, we too are his messengers. So take this moment in this time of prayer to say, what am I shouting? And what road am I clearing? Who am I? What am I on this planet to do? Because it's not by accident that you're here, right? You're here on purpose. You are here as a part of a greater design that is so beautiful, that is so intricate, that is so brilliant, that we use... Uh, adjectives all the time to try and describe it but like Lily when she was trying to describe it a worship night she just runs out of words and we find that our language is so finite where he is so infinite so father today I thank you Lord for each person right here in this room I thank you for every child that's downstairs I thank you, Father, for what this church is on this planet to do. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, that we can be called family. And I recognise, Father, sometimes we do that uh, functionally and sometimes we're dysfunction and sometimes we do that great and sometimes we, we don't, but we're still family and it's not anything but the blood of Christ that makes us that. And so, Father, we are bound together by what Christ has done and we say thank you, Father. Uh, Father, help us to love you better. Help us to love those around us better uh, so that we can be all we are in you. So, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.